So uh, the first thing is to read the script and be sure it's something that you want to take on, you know, um, uh, quality-wise. And uh, the second thing you do is uh, break down a script so you work out exactly how many scenes each character has. So you know, w with, without any doubt, who ha you know who's the lead, who are the supporting leads, and uh, right down to who has just one line. And beyond that, even working out if there's something that, that could be an extra, but it's borderline because they've got to deliver some great reaction, then um, that's got to be part of a, a breakdown. Um, so then you sort of uh, spread it out, you know, put it out on Spotlight, spread it around agents, and uh, this is all assuming that you've got your your star that is actually that will trigger finance. Um, so that's the first thing you do is a, you know a bit of development casting or making sure that they've got a name that means the project can actually happen. Uh, and the I do try and stagger the breakdown so you don't get so overwhelmed by suggestions because of course you know correctly agents when they see it on spotlight will pick up the phone and start pushing clients and. Um, so you try and do sort of uh, the main roles first, and you really don't want to hear from anybody until you've got those cracked. Um, but my favourite part is the one-liners and the day players, because uh, those actors have got to be so talented to come in and be a nurse or be a teacher or a policeman or whatever the role is. And in one line, you've got to buy that you're in a hospital or you're a, you're a mother who's just been told your son's dead or the things you see actors do for for one line in a in a in a film or a television is extraordinary. So they're my favourite. Um, uh, so when you've been through the audition process, and that's as varied as you like, it can be improv or it could be um, a scene prepared or just a chat to the director. Um, then uh, you, you obviously consult and help the director, you know, push the director into the decision. You then do the deal and the, do the deal memo for the actor so everyone knows what the terms are before the actor arrives on set. And uh, and that's it. At the point of deal memo, you're done. Uh, but I do always follow up with a phone call to a few agents and the production, the producer or the director, if I can speak to them, to find out how it was for everybody. Because I do want to know, for future reference, how actors behaved, how they were prepped, um, how, you know, how it, how it worked, any problems, all that kind of thing, you know. And from the actor, I like to know whether I should work with that team again. Um, I want to know were they treated with respect and were they, um, yeah, were they looked after, you know? I mean, each day, you don't really know what each day is going to hold in casting and you have no idea what, what direction it, it, the, whole, the whole shape of thing is going to go because people um, have such different tastes. It's so subjective, obviously, casting. So you could be the one caster on, on ten different projects, but... Um, actors, uh, directors' taste are so different, not just in the way uh, things look and the way the dynamic should look, um, but also acting styles, you know. Uh, so you have to get onto that wavelength and each job you feel like you're starting from scratch and each job you feel like you sort of don't know what you're doing, you know, which is a good thing, you know. Budget squeezed is the biggest thing because you used to be given a good three months to cast, and if it was somewhere outside of London, you would go, not only the casting team would go and live in Cork or Ghana or Hong Kong, all these places we've cast in, you know, um, but the director would too, and they would immerse themselves in the culture. If you think about the way someone like Alan Parker made films, uh, he wouldn't uh, step foot on set without knowing in great detail Argentinian history for um, Evita, you know, and um, the, really soaking up the Irish atmosphere for not only the commitments, but things like Angela's Ashes down in Limerick. Um, and that's gone. Directors, they, they don't have time, and they're probably also their fees are probably reduced, so they're not, they can't commit those months and months of prep you know, and expertise and local knowledge. Um, and for us too, you, you got to really, you got time to prep and spread the word and um, soak up the flavour and really search for um, you know, local talent and make sure you'd exhausted that. And that's all gone. It all has to be much more immediate now.
But <clears throat> the great thing, obviously, is technology and the speed with which you can send information out. And you, you know, this, we used to use a thing called Feature Facts, which BT um, provided, and that would fax all the agents the breakdown, and it was a complete nightmare. Um, and it would take you half a day just just to distribute the brief. Whereas now, you know, before I came here this morning, I, it took me twenty minutes just to put something on Spotlight and. And you know that's great. It's 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 gone. It means it's a lot more twenty four hours now. And so I put briefs on uh, breakdowns on spotlight uh, at random hours of the night. You know when it suits me, when I can. And you know just agents sometimes suggest at, you know one o four a.m. and stuff like that. Um, so it, the technology has meant that uh, there's less rest, I guess. Uh, but it's made it incredibly easy to to spread the word. You know. Self-taping is is the way forward, you know, and the only frustration there is if you've got notes, um, there's a little bit of lag time and you can't you can't do it right there and then in the room. Um, but that's OK. It doesn't stop me from sending notes back to the actor. And, you know, if there's anything they can do to adjust it, to give them the best chance of getting it, then um, I'll send them back and they can retape and, and send it a day later. But yeah, it's mu it's much more global now, definitely. And as a cast, you're expected to have knowledge of um, ev everything, you know, Scandinavian actors, American, Australian, um, you, you really are expected. And, and fair enough, if you don't have a list to hand of, uh, you know, the top Ghanaian actors, you are expected to know how to access it pretty quickly, you know. It's the volume of actors you're expected to see now. And uh, it used to be that people would just, and it changed for the better, I think, generally, because people would directors would come in and they would really just want you to book their mates, you know, or their ensembles. So if you look at David Lean films, he used the same actors all the time and whether they were right for the role or not was irrelevant, you know, whether they were the right ethnicity for the role didn't matter to him. But, um, but I'm a huge David Lean fan, but casting was not a strong point. Um, but nowadays, uh, people want to work with new people, they want to make fresh discoveries, again, as long as there's a star on board that has triggered the finance. After that, they're free uh, to uh, to make new discoveries, and the volume of people you're expected to see has changed. It, I, I try and keep a positive attitude because volume for me is great because that increases my knowledge for the next job and, and the one after. But I do sometimes feel it's slightly unfair to actors, and most good casters will tell you that the people who actually get the job are generally have come in on the first day or, the, or maybe the second day, but certainly in the first week of casting. And the, with the fact that it's so easy for people to self-tape and it's so easy to upload and it's so easy for directors to you know, f flip forward through clips of actors, um, that does come a point where you feel like you're literally looking under stones, just to, you know, again, an exhaustive process, which, um, yeah, I don't think it's fair for the actors who you saw on the first day. Casting directors are relatively new. If you look at Spotlight's 85-year history, um, and we weren't around uh, when Spotlight was founded, casters weren't. So that's relatively new. Um, and I think, but since we've existed, I don't think it's changed much. It's very important. It's a very important symbiotic relationship between casters and agents. And, you know, at its basis description, um, you know, the agent is the seller and we're the buyer, but not really. Those same agents will also have the talent that we need um, to, that is a bankable name that will make the project happen and all that kind of stuff. You know, everything I answer will come back to that, the fact that you've got to have a star um, before you even begin. And so that we become, in that situation, we become the seller. We're selling our, our projects to the agent, you know, and convincing him it's the best thing and, and this is creatively what their actor should do next. And they will, you know, helping them to understand they will definitely get paid. Um, you know, it's creative excellence and uh, financial um, sure, surety is really what the agents are looking for. And that's always existed as a, you know, a sort of us as the middleman. Um, I don't think anything of that like that has changed. The, the, be the best for me is, and I do pride myself on getting on a director's wavelength, and when I can start to predict who they're, who they're going to book and who they're going to like, and when you, you, you know, minds start meeting and you know exactly who to show them. First, the first day of casting is hideous. 
you're such a bag of nerves and especially if the director's there I mean, a lot of what I do is for directors who are abroad and I put people on tape and I'm I'm a lone wolf or, you know working on my own with the actor um, but when the director's there it's petrifying on the first day because you really hope you've uh, managed to um, predict what their taste is Coming from a casting family, there's four of us. There's only four of us in the family and we're all in casting. So it's been everywhere with us, you know, pretty much on holidays when it used to be the, the books of, you know, ac actors and actresses. And uh, I remember my mum thumbing through uh, Spotlight and at one point she got repetitive strain injury and she had to have a wrist guard, you know, to, to go through Spotlight. And that's something that's changed, by the way, but my parents still um, will look through all the Spotlight books and that's how they cast, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been, it's been very important. I'm sure to, again, to all, um, good reputable casters, it's, it's the way we want to cast. We, we can't keep up with people, uh, Facebooking you or, and I do use Facebook and Twitter. And if I'm looking for kids or something unusual, I will use them as resources, but, um, we can't keep up with all those messages. There has to be sort of one true method of get, of making suggestions. And um, emails, you know, uh, casters are, have got to keep up with emails from their their clients. So uh, you're you're only servicing the emails from your directors and your producers. So you need one um, method of receiving suggestions. And Spotlight is is really it's really important that that stays as the industry standard. You know, I use them if uh, I'm looking for something unusual. So teens or um, if I'm looking for, um, I had to cast uh, Peruvian people a few years ago, and so by any means necessary, you know. So if I'm trying to trying to spread the word, um, and so I'll be friends with anybody because for me it's it's only about business and it's about spreading the word. If I'm looking for something that's not conventionally uh, easy to cast, mm -hmm. and also sorry, celebrating um, work, other people's work, you know, in short films, I love to post those and. Um, and my own, to promote my own things. So the few directors and producers who follow me, I want them to be aware of uh, things like Hatfields and McCoys, which I've cast, which is coming out in the States. It's on television on the 28th of May or something like that. But I'm not saying that for a plug, but you know, it's important for me to, to people know what I've done and any work that I'm proud of, I'll stick on there. I do worry about um, respect for actors beyond the star system, I worry about um, the fact that directors will uh, sort of treat them as commodities. I mean, that, that's always been there with people lining around corridors to audition, but um, coming back to the volume thing, I, I, I worry that um, directors are less respectful these days, and that has changed. It used to be that people would come in and just have a chat, which I don't agree with, um, but just having a, a chat and a long conversation about what they felt about the script and, and trying to, you know, hear the director's vision. And then people would cast from that and there was no recordings, there was no, um, not, not much reading from scenes or anything like that. So I worry about, you know, sort of, you know, get the actor to read six scenes and they've, obviously that's all got to be off page. And then the director will watch, you know, several seconds of that when all that prep work. So I, I do worry about that. Um, and also reality shows. I, I worry about the, you know, even though I watch a few of them myself, but um, the predominance of that and less, less budgeting for good drama, um, that does concern me. Um, the quality of project that gets through, if, something, if somebody manages to raise money at the moment for a project, the quality is much higher at the moment. Um, so, yeah, perhaps there's, you know, and again, if reality shows are what people want to watch and that's where budgets are going to go, uh, then again, the drama that does make it through seems to be of exceptional quality, so that's good. And, you, and also a return to, and I love working with new directors, I do a lot of short films, and it, you know, there's, you've always got to invest in the next generation. But another thing that Recession has done is to go back to seasoned hands who really know what they're doing. So Kevin Reynolds, for example, who did the Hatfields and McCoys miniseries, um, hasn't worked for a while, and it, you know, very happily so, um, but they needed someone like, only he could have pulled it off given that budget and shooting in Romania. So a return to really seasoned hands and maestros, I guess, which is the way I grew up, you know, always, always be in love with the director I was taught by my parents. <laughs>